Thank you, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's really wonderful. And uh, as you'll uh, see at the base of the, uh, the slide here, first of all, I mean, English is my first and only language, but I don't know how to use conjugal <laughs> verbs. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, I'm talking about some joint work with uh, Alice and uh, Kwa. Um, Kwa Dong Wen, there's another Kwa Wen who's also who had been based had been based at Stanford, now is based at Berkeley, also does algebraic geometry, not the same person. Okay, so this is Quad Dong Wen. And if you're thinking of offering a job to a very smart person this year, you should think of offering a job to him or to various other people, but um, <laughs> but uh, Quad would be a good choice. So I'm, what I'm going to be talking about, as I say, is um, the ongoing work. Uh, I think we've, res we've resolved most of the issues, but there's one annoying little detail I'll mention what that little annoying detail is. As we uh, as we get deeper into this, all right. So uh, I'll remind you, and I, I think this really is reminding because we've heard uh, many lectures about Mahler functions over the week. Uh, but I'll remind you what it, what one might mean by a Mahler function. And uh, here I'm going to call it a K-Mahler function. I'll tell you what K is for me in, in a few moments. Uh, it's an analytic function, or maybe just a power series over the complex numbers, uh, which satisfies an interesting difference equation, uh, which with respect to the substitution, t goes to t to the k. Right? And uh, I'm going to list different possible meanings of, what's, of what one might mean when we're talking about a Mahler function. Uh, the ones that uh, you've heard most about uh, so far in this conference would be of the linear type. And so those would be. Uh, functions which satisfy a linear difference equation with respect to that substitution uh, over the, say, over the rational functions. Um, he's specializing, actually going in a, in a different direction, you might talk about Mahler functions which satisfy equations of any order, but the ones which seem to be somewhat interesting and the ones that Mahler actually studied uh, be the order one equations. So we look for a polynomial, okay, it's a rational function in T, but in X and Y we take it to be, uh, take it to be a polynomial. Uh, so that's, your function satisfies this order one difference equation. Again, with coefficients coming from uh, the rational functions. So these first two types are ones that I'm not going to say too much about. But I will specialize somewhat the order one equations to the rational type equations. So if you like, this is the special case of the order one equation, but where the after clearing denominators, I'm just looking at P being uh, Y minus RTX. Okay, Tom. These are all supposed to be what? These are functions. These are. No, but it's a, it's a definition of what? Exactly. Of, a, of what it means to be a Mahler function of whatever. 
So all these four things make the k Haywire function? Yes. Oh. It's a k Haywire function of some special kind. Oh, so these certain types? Yes. And the one that we'll really focus on is the specialization of the rational type, where I require that the equation be given by a polynomial. Okay, so that is, that's when you make the substitution t goes t to the k, you can re-express your function as a polynomial in f, well, where the polynomial is allowed to have coefficients from the rational functions. Okay, so just definitions for now. Um, usually, <coughs> Okay, well, when I say usually, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say usually. <laughs> so usually, when people talk about k Mahler functions, they want k to be an integer, an integer bigger than 1. So like you substitute t goes to t to the k. I'm going to allow it to be somewhat more general. I'm going to allow it to be any positive rational, well, as long as you don't take 1. Okay, I don't, I'm not interested in equations where you don't do anything to f. And so I want you to do something to it. So I want some substitution to be going on. And then, of course, we might say, well, then it doesn't make sense. The, the power series, you know, the ring Laurent series, is not actually preserved by that substitution. If, say, k is fractional, we'll pass the algebraic closure. Okay, so work with Pursuit series, and then it makes sense to talk about such a substitution. Okay, so uh, now I'll make, you know, I'll make more comments about this, but. I think the reason why k is usually taken to be an integer in, in this kind of work is that most of the focus, at least in recent years, has been on the linear type equations. And there, if you had a linear type equation which involved, say, a reciprocal, you could just replace everything with the inverse of the automorphism and write it with the t goes to t to the k. For, and for the order one equations, also the same kind of reasoning works. I mean, you could just replace everything with sigma inverse, and it would give you the, essentially the same equation. These last two kinds, it really makes a difference. And the reason it really makes a difference is that if you really care about having solutions that are analytic, or in power series, or in, in Laurent series, it's hard to satisfy equations, of, very hard to satisfy equations of this form when k is an integer bigger than 2. It's not so hard, well, it's not easy, but it's not so hard, to satisfy such equations when you take k to be fractional. So if you take k to be one half, then with some mild conditions on, on q, one can actually find analytic solutions to these equations. If you take k to be two, it's very difficult. I mean, it happens sometimes, but it's, it's very difficult to actually find solutions. Okay. And I'll make various statements, say such and such is a Mahler function, something happens with it. Uh, I'll try to be careful to say transcendental every time, but I might not. Okay, so, but I, I mean transcendental. So I'll make some assertion about certain things are algebraically independent, which are obviously false if the functions involved are algebraic. Uh, but I'll try, I'll try to be careful. But just mm -hmm. be aware that this is an intended hypothesis <coughs> throughout. So transcendental means over C of T. Over C of T. Yeah, so not, uh, not an algebraic function. Uh, again, if you're actually dealing with this with the case where these functions are uh, honest power series, Laurent series, in case an integer, then algebraic and rational are the same. But if I allow myself to pass to the Pursu series and they allow fractional exponents, then you can get examples where you have algebraic but not rational uh, solutions to these kinds of equations. Okay, so let me just say a little something about where this all comes from, which again, I missed the first two days, and so maybe you've, you've all heard this, but I'll just uh, say this. So these are called Mahler functions because well, Mahler didn't call them Mahler functions, but uh, Mahler introduced them in 1929 uh, to prove some really uh, amazing results about transcendence of special values of functions which satisfy these kinds of equations. Uh, so here I make the Okay, so now coming back to the comment I made about the k versus 1 over k. Uh, so, of course, he doesn't call these Mahler functions. Uh, in fact, as far as I can tell, and okay, as I mentioned before, when I <laughs> didn't know how to use is, English is my first and only language, so reading this paper in German, maybe I missed something. But as, as far as I can tell, he doesn't call them anything. They're just 
You have some functions that satisfy these conditions, okay? And they, and they prove whatever. Um, but he kept working on this for a long time, okay? And uh, in fact, he, has some, he saw some really nice papers in the 80s where he works on these, and he calls these K-series uh, when he gets to that point, right? But the interesting point is that for him, but I was calling a k Mahler function, he would have called a 1 over k series because he writes the equation with the t to the k on the other side. Right? And again, just saying you know, this, this confusion about which, which we might mean does show up in some papers in, in the literature where people make a point of setting only the case where you have t to the k on the right side of the equation. And well, then there aren't that many functions to which the theorem applies. You know, if you move it to the other side, then it actually starts to apply to something. Okay, so what are the kinds of things that he proved? Uh, <clears throat> so one thing he proved already in that first paper is that if you take a, a transcendental uh, k Mahler function and you value, and if, if it's defined over a number field, so before I said that you could take the Mahler functions to have complex coefficients, you know, to be power series with complex uh, coefficients, but if the coefficients are actually over a number field, okay? then you, know, you have some hope maybe getting algebraic numbers or something when you evaluate it, but you don't. Okay, so if you evaluate this function at a sufficiently general uh, algebraic point, you get a transcendental value. And sufficiently general is not just some abstract thing. You can say precisely what sufficiently general is. Okay, so uh, this is in the case of a, say where it satisfies a rational type equation. You, you know, remember I'm expressing the f of t to the k is some rational function in f of t, well, if you just kind of avoid the resultants of the numerator and denominator of that, of that function, of that r, which expresses the dependence, evaluate your alpha, evaluate f at this point, you get a transcendental number. Okay, so it's, it's nice. I mean, it's a very, very strong general result. But could a similar result hold for f of alpha transcendental over l, and l is just a that seems plausible. I haven't actually, it's probably known, but I haven't actually yeah, worked it out. You know. They're probably here in this room who know the answer to that question, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Yes? So this, uh, this result says that if you take the Mahler function, uh, if you consider algebraic inputs to this function, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Consider algebraic inputs, you get transcendental outputs. Yeah. As long as you avoid certain explicitly described points that it might cause. Yeah, so I was curious how, how common is this behavior for transcendental functions? Well, you can, you can cook up transcendental functions that take algebraic values that include many algebraic sure, values. Sure, sure. I mean, and ones that which... require cooking. I mean, there's a general method due to Shulovsky where you, you have a certain kind of function that satisfies a certain linear equation and you know something about the growth and yeah. its values of There are general results. Yeah, there are general. Yeah, this is this is maybe the first in a long line of general results. Along, uh, basically, basically the principle is if you know something about functional equations that that your f satisfies, and this will descend to some. You know, this will it's special value, special values. Uh, if your function is hypertranscendental in every reasonable sense then there's a reasonable chance that when you evaluate it at algebraic numbers, you have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, basically, you have, there's no, you have no control on anything if, if you have no control on anything. Okay. Uh, oh, right. And this is, okay. So I mentioned the first one because this, this first theorem actually appears in this first paper. Uh, but it's true also for linear type functions. I mean, you know, so... Like Michael said, it's, it's true in, in many more contexts. Uh, perhaps the strongest result about Mahler functions along mm. this form, well, okay, so I'll just state it in the, okay, first I'll, I'll explain, explain this part and then I'll, I'll, I'll state what the, the strongest form is. Basically, if you have, I guess maybe it's not the strongest form because I'm going to say it with multiple possible interacting. But let me just say it's, if you have, they're individual. You have a sequence of Mahler functions, possibly with respect to different, different choices of k, all defined over all defined over number field. Uh, and here to be safe, not just safe because it's only known in this case, of linear type. 
<laughs> so you have these Mahler functions of linear type. Uh, essentially, the algebraic relations that you might have on special values of these functions are exactly the algebraic relations that the functions satisfy. Where, again, there, may, you know, there will be some exceptional set which is not true. Okay, so you can explicitly compute some exceptional sets. So that's provided that you are evaluating your functions at algebraic points outside of this exceptional set, algebraic dependence amongst the special values is precisely the algebraic dependence that you saw for the functions. Okay, so functional transcendence and uh, transcendence of values is, is, exactly, uh, is, is exactly tied. And so here I was expressing a slightly, slightly different way of saying this. Rather than looking at automorphisms where I'm just, I'm just working, say, with power series in one variable, and I, and I substitute t equals t to the k in one variable, and you know, t equals t to the l, you could look at power series in many variables, or, or functions, functions in many variables, and do substitutions of the exponents, which might mix the various exponents. Results are known uh, in this world, too. Okay. And the special case where you consider uh, K and L Mahler functions. Um, yeah, so right, this is the, the theorem that I was mentioning. <laughs> uh, you consider the, the special case where you take Mahler functions, two different Mahler functions for two different, for two different <laughs> values for K and L. And if you happen to know that these Mahler functions are transcendental and algebraic dependent, then, it, then it's almost any choice of of, al of algebraic uh, inputs, you'll get algebraically independent outputs. Okay, yeah, L equals K is possible. Ah. Okay, L equals K is possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm going to be dealing with the case when K is not equal to L. But, uh, yeah, sure. That's, that's, that's not a lot of possibility. Okay. Um, yeah, so, it's, you know, it's, okay. so, in the statement here, we might even allow, well, I suppose that's the way that I, have I stated it? No? Well, I haven't. Okay, so you could try taking f equals g, but not, <laughs> f and g aren't, aren't algebraically, yeah, f equals g, but then they're not algebraically independent, and so you're not going to get anything interesting. Except that what you get is what I, what I said before, that essentially the map, the evaluation map is going to preserve, it's going to be an isomorphism uh, at almost every place. So you get no new um, algebraic dependence. Beyond that, you already have at the level of the functions. Okay, so the, that, that's great if what you're interested in is special values. And I think that, as I said, this is the reason why Mahler introduced these functions, and this is why they've, been, why they've been studied. The problem is that in order to apply this kind of result, you need to know what are the functional relations between f and g, or f and g algebraically independent. And if they're not, you know, if there is a dependence, <laughs> if there's a dependence between them, then of course you're going to get a dependence on the special values. And it's not entirely obvious, you know, what kind, of, what one might expect. Okay, so uh, so we've you've heard about this uh, theorem of Chomsky uh, and Bell <coughs> that um, if you take linear type Mahler functions, well here I'll do a single one. If it's a single Mahler function, which happens to be Mahler of linear type with respect to two different multiplicatively independent exponents, K and L, uh, then it can't be transcendental. <laughs> It'll have to be rational. Okay, so you can't have a transcendental function which is simultaneously K Mahler and L Mahler for multiplicatively K and L, uh, multiplicatively independent K and, K and L of linear type. Okay, just a general result. And uh, the same is true for. Uh, polynomial type functions. Okay, so you can't have a function, f, which is k Mahler and L Mahler, a polynomial type, so it satisfies the equation f of t to the k equals a polynomial in f, and f of t to the l equals some other polynomial in f. Uh, function is transcendental. Okay? It just doesn't happen. Okay. Now, it's interesting to note that you can have functions which are K and L Mahler of order one with respect to lots of choices of exponents. In fact, everything, essentially. Uh, here, I guess, well, here I'm doing it just for 
uh, integers. Okay? But, um, so if you think of the J function, it has lots of symmetries. Right? And uh, because it's, it parameterizes uh, you know, the moduli problem for elliptic curves, you know that if you have uh, the elliptic curve parameterized you know, corresponding to little j of t, and elliptic curve corresponding to little j of, well, I guess 1 over k times, or, or k times t, those guys are going to parameterize isogenous elliptic curves uh, with an isogeny of, of order k. And this relation is encoded by a modular polynomial. It's encoded by phi k. So moving to the multiplicative setting, that's what I mean by this capital J. So you can write the usual Klein J function as a meromorphic function applied to Q, where Q is e to the 2 pi i times tau, uh, you would get an interesting modular relation, you know, so an interesting algebraic relation between J, capital J, and the one which you get by substituting in T to the K for every integer. Okay? So uh, <clears throat> that's well, it's interesting, um, but it's, it also means that if you're going to study Mahler equations of order one, then the results will necessarily look very different from what we see for either the linear case or the polynomial case. Okay. So, so I'm not going to study this right now. I mean, it's like I said, it's an interesting question, just what's going on in this order, in, the, in this order one case, but it's the answers are more complicated, not necessarily more complicated than, than what we've seen already in the, um, in the linear and the polynomial case. So the question that we set out to answer uh, is if you like the k Mahler uh, analog of the, the, of the theorem that uh, Adam Chevsky and Bell uh, proved. Okay. So can you have two different functions, f and g, both transcendental. One of them, say f, is k Mahler, a polynomial type, and g is l Mahler, also a polynomial type. Uh, and uh, we assume about these, of course, they're both transcendental. Could it happen that there's an algebraic dependence between them? Okay. So that is, in the, in the hypothesis of the specialization theorem, you know, are we guaranteed that whenever you take functions which are k Mahler, which are Mahler a polynomial type with respect to multiplicatively independent uh, substitutions, that they're necessarily algebraically independent? <laughs> right. So the um, so Zonier's theorem is the case for f equals g. So if you like, I think of the dependence between these is just that x equals y. So it's a, a special case of this, but it's, you know, it's a special case. It's not, it doesn't totally answer this question. Okay, so the, this is the question. Uh, is this for uh, a single iteration of the, so it's f of x to the k equals the... Uh, f of x to the k equals some polynomial... Uh, where the, where the polynomial will be a power of k that will not. Well, follows because you can substitute. Right? So you just iterate, iterate the automorphism, and you're going to get. You know, so if f of x to the k is equal to polynomial on f, then f of x to the k squared is equal to something. You can iterate this and get some other equation. Okay. All right, so I want to reformulate this a bit more abstractly. Although, I'll point out in a few moments that this reformulation is not an exact reformulation, uh, in that there will be some annoying counterexamples to this reformulation, which shouldn't be counterexamples to the, uh, to the actual Mahler problem. Okay. All right, so I'm going to work with the, but actually, maybe I should have named all three of these. So I have three algebraically closed fields, C, which you ought to think of as C, you like. Uh, L, which you ought to think of as, say, the algebraic closure, you know, the field of algebraic functions, so C of T algebraic closure. And K, which is another algebraically closed field, which you ought to think of as being, say, the Pursue series. Right? Okay. And on these, I, uh, on these I have a couple of automorphisms, which I'm calling sigma and tau. Assuming about these automorphisms that they commute, 
So you ought to be thinking that sigma is, say, substituting in t to the k, tau is substituting in t to the l. Uh, the fixed fields of both these automorphisms are the same. Okay, so the fixed fields are just the small, the c, which is true, like if you're doing the substitution uh, t to the k or t to the l. And uh, I'll also assume that they're independent. Okay, so they, they commute, but there are no other relations anywhere, except where there have to be. So of course, you know, they, they do satisfy an interesting relation on their common fixed field, because they're fixed, you know, they're the identity there. But away from there, if you take any other point, then no iterates of sigma apply to the point is equal to any of the iterate of tau, unless you're doing the zero iterate in both cases. Okay. Which again is true for substitution, the t to the k and the t to the l substitution. Okay, so this is the basic hypothesis, the difference field way of, of thinking about the, about the situation we're in. And now I'm asking, could we have difference equations of the form sigma of f equals p of f, where p is some polynomial with coefficients in this intermediate field. Remember that intermediate field for us was something like the field of rational functions. Uh, and somebody else who satisfies a difference equation with respect to the other automorphism, with respect to tau. So that each of the solutions is transcendental over the field where I define the equations. So they're not in L, where L is like the algebraic functions, it's algebraically closed, I'm saying they're not there. So they're not algebraic over L, but there's an algebraic dependence between G and F, which, of course, you just say algebraically that G is in the algebraic closure of the field generated. I wrote K here, this should be L, so L, because this is easy to do. <laughs> it is to okay, so that's the question. And, uh, the, the problem for Mahler functions is just this question with the with specializing to the fields that I've mentioned before. Okay, so, right, so the, the, annoying, the annoying thing is the answer to this question is yes, it can happen, right? Um, even though it's not supposed to happen with Mahler functions. So let me just point out why it could happen. All right, so uh, basically, if the equations of are closely enough related to a group, this might happen. And so here's an example, I'm just given. You could take P to be the polynomial Y to the N, and Q to be the polynomial Z to the M, where N and M are multiplicatively independent alike. Actually, well, it wouldn't be a counterexample if they weren't. Right? And then, of course, in any of the, any power series field, in any reasonable sense, if you define your automorphism by substituting the variable, it goes to t to the n or t to the m, then every monomial satisfies, well, every, it's not quite every monomial, but every uh, power, you know, so just the variable to whatever power, variable to the alpha, will satisfy this equation. And you may say, well, well, that's not a problem because in the power series fields that we know and love, in the Laurent series fields, uh, those solutions are all algebraic, and so they don't count against us for purposes of the, of the Mahler equations. But there are power series fields and pairs of power series fields where they're not algebraic. Okay, so, for example, you just do the iterated power series in two variables, do the same, do the same substitution. Well, that new variable, the new S, is not algebraic over the power series fields in just T. And it's a new solution to this equation. Okay, that's annoying. Okay, now, this even violates Zonier's theorem. Okay, so it's, you know, so it's, shouldn't happen. This, this kind of thing shouldn't happen. Um, so this is, the part in red is the part that maybe Alice believes we've solved, but I'm not sure that we've actually, actually solved this. Uh, do you believe we solved this thing? Okay, well, there's a possibility that Alice believes we would solve this. Um, <laughs> these, this problem seems to be ruled out in the special case of uh, where we're dealing with actual Mahler functions. And, yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you just, okay, we'll, we'll get into details in a moment. But the basic issue is that the exceptional cases, the cases that we don't, that don't follow directly from our analysis, 
uh, are those which are defined by special polynomials. I'll define those in a moment. And it seems that whenever, if we really had to deal with special polynomials, uh, defining interesting Mahler functions, that they would either give us algebraic functions, in which case we don't have to deal with them, it's just not part of the question, uh, or the algebraic relations between solutions to different special functions are totally under control. Okay, that's morally speaking what seems to be the case, although there is a, for me there's at least a little detail that I'm not 100% convinced that we've, that we've solved. But in any case, this general reformulation does have, unfortunately, counterexamples. And this is, you know, so I asked Michael yesterday about the general reformulation of the linear case. Uh, I would hope the linear case doesn't have counterexamples. It really ought to be just sort of a differential or a different Galois theoretic kind of thing, which would apply generally, but I guess it hasn't been done. Right? Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay, so let me define the, the polynomials that we're not going to talk about. Call these special functions or special rational functions or special polynomials. And so a special rational function, I'll define it at this level of generality, is one which, well, it might not actually be uh, a map, you know, an isogeny of an algebraic group, but it might as well be. <laughs> okay, so what I, what I mean is you have a map, you think of your rational function as a map from the projective line to the projective line. Uh, of course, this doesn't have, this isn't a group. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't have a group structure. But there might be an algebraic group which maps to it, uh, with a finite to, to one map, so that this rational function basically looks like a map of algebraic groups. Okay, so the examples that you have, ought to have in mind are where G is the multiplicative group, and you just do the usual inclusion of the multiplicative group into uh, the P1, and P really is a power function. Okay, that's, that's an example. One which is maybe a little less obvious is we might take G to be the multiplicative group and this pi to be the map which, uh, I guess, you do x plus 1 over x. Right? So if x is a variable on the multiplicative group. And you take lambda to be a power function. And then this p here will be a Chebyshev polynomial. Okay? So these guys are in. You can get more, in if you're doing general rational functions, you get something a bit more interesting by taking the elliptic curve. And you get Lattes maps. And, well, if you're characteristic P, then there are other interesting examples. But uh, special functions are special. Okay, you really ought, ought to think of these as, as being rather special. These definitions of sigma, there's no total. I thought there were two community not all. Yeah, so I guess I'm defining it to be, this is special with respect to sigma. Okay. I mean, we're talking about. Yeah, well, okay, I, I'm going to give a, a statement in a moment which says that, at least for polynomials, you can ignore the sigma. <laughs> okay. So the statement is that if we specialize to uh, characteristic zero, and, um, yeah, if we're in characteristic zero and we want these to be polynomials, then, okay, you can take a linear polynomial. That's special because... Well, it's maybe not entirely obvious because it's affine, okay? but you can always, you can make a, a conjugation to make it look like it's a map of algebraic groups because linear functions are. <laughs> I mean, if they don't have a constant term, are maps of algebraic groups. Then you have linear functions that I'm not going to allow. You have power functions, you have Chebyshev polynomials, and then things that are conjugated to these things. So basically, in our context, special is extremely special. The ones that I don't want to talk about are linear functions, power functions, and Chebyshev polynomials, and then things which might be conjugated to them. And it's this, this part that I just mumbled, which is why I put it in red on the other page, because what exactly is happening to the conjugation is not 100% obvious. Okay. So the, the theorem, which I think we've actually proven, uh, is that... The, the question that I asked does have a, well, I don't remember this, this negative answer, because I asked whether, whether you could have an algebraic dependence, and the answer is no, provided at least one of the equations is with a non-special polynomial. Okay. So, and since this is symmetric and there's nothing special about tau versus sigma, I'll say P is not special. 
Okay? So you have, <coughs> you have f and g. They satisfy these smaller equations. Well, smaller equations in a generalized sense. So there's difference equations with respect to sigma and tau. One with respect to sigma, the other with respect to tau. And assuming that the equation that say, one of them satisfies, say f satisfies, uh, it has a non-special polynomial. So p is not just raising to a power. It's not a Chebyshev polynomial. It's nothing conjugate, but it's not linear. Okay? Then uh, it can't happen that there's an algebraic dependence between f and g over the, over the ground field. This is about the internal algebraicity. Yes. Yeah. Well, because we're because it's basically it's transcendence to be a one. So if there were an algebraic dependence, then they'd be interalgebraic. Okay. And I'll just say this again. Uh, as stated, so that is in this general form of the C, L, and K, we really do need to make the hypothesis that one of these guys is not special. For Mahler functions, it's it looks like it's probably true without the restriction. You know, we could take both P and Q to be special, but uh, you know, okay. it looks like it. That's, that's probably okay. Okay, so how does this go? Uh, basically, we're going to do a similar kind of argument to what we've heard before. We have two equations. So we, we have sigma of F equals P of F, and we have uh, tau of G equals uh, Q of G, you know, it seems, and we have some algebraic dependence between, between F and G. <laughs> so it would seem that the thing to do would be to really use all three equations, but we're not going to. We're really only going to look at, well, okay, we are going to use all three equations, but very mildly are we going to use, use the second equation. We're going to reduce this from a problem about two different equations with respect to two different automorphisms to a question about Difference equations involving a single automorphism. All right, so we're assuming that G and F, there's an algebraic dependence between them, which from the point of view of the fields that generates, just say that they have the same algebraic closures. Okay. Again, using Ometer's observation that you know, this is transcendence to be a one situation, so if there's a dependence, then they're actually interalgebraic. Okay, so it's a little computation. So I'm going to look at, I don't know why, yeah, so you look at tau applied to f. That's something else. Okay. Tau, of course, is acting on, on the uh, field of k. And uh, it acts on l. So it's, tau is going to preserve this uh, field. Well, it's going to take f into the image under tau of the, of the fields uh, l of g. But L is preserved by tau, and G, of course, is sent to G of tau. But G satisfies this difference equation. So uh, tau of G is equal to a polynomial in G. In fact, I suppose that's, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, the argument that I'm giving here, we allow, you know, all we, all we really require is that this be rational, or even algebraic. Okay? So that's just that's, uh, G be al that's tau of G be algebraic over G. They give you the same algebraically closed field. Okay. And our hypothesis was that's the same as the field we get with F. Okay. So we started knowing that F satis that F is interalgebraic with this function G, which satisfies a tau difference equation. So it follows that F also satisfies a tau difference equation. Although really all the more we can say is that it's an order one difference equation. That's, we don't know that it's that's tau of f as a polynomial in f or something. But what we do know is that it satisfies an order one difference equation with respect to the second uh, automorphism. Okay, so we now have this solution to a sigma difference equation of the, of the special form, sigma of f equals a polynomial in f, and a second difference equation with respect to tau, which is, well, it's, yeah. it's um, Order one, okay, but it's order one. And I want to think about it a bit. I want to think of it geometrically. We can look at the locus of that pair, f comma f tau. So look at all of the equations that's algebraic equations that are satisfied with that over L. That's going to define a curve inside of uh, affine two space over L. And 
if we hit that point, that we have a generic point on this curve, f comma f tau, if we hit it with sigma, that's going to go to something which is, well, goes somewhere, but so it goes to something which is going to be in the curve C sigma, so the image of sigma under the automorphism, uh, automorphism sigma, but the f is going to satisfy, you know, sigma of f equals p of f, and the, the f tau satisfies that sigma of f equals p tau of f, of f tau, and using the fact that sigma and tau commute. So that cu the curve is skew invariant, sigma skew invariant, under this algebraic, or this rational, or this, this regular function. Okay. So the, the function p comma p tau restricts to a map from the curve c to c sigma, a dominant map from C to C sigma. Okay. okay, well, that's good. Because we know something about these things. <laughs> okay. uh, so we did, we worked very hard to try to understand uh, what, these, what these, curves, these curves look like. And uh, we have a, a reasonably, you know, we have a complete classification. I don't know how reasonable it is, but we have a complete classification of what these, of what these curves look like. <coughs> okay. And uh, What's, what's nice, I would say, about this is that um, it's going to break into two different kinds of arguments depending upon whether the original equation was defined over the constants or not. You know, so whether our polynomial P is fixed by tau or it's not, or it's not fixed by tau, same as being fixed by sigma or not fixed, not fixed by sigma. When it's fixed by tau, so when P equals P tau, well, then this curve is... Also going to be uh, it's also going to be fixed uh, fixed by tau and fixed by sigma. We're really looking at invariant curves. Okay, so the the questions come down to <laughs> the questions about just invariance. Forget all this all the skew stuff. And uh, there, if you're only interested in understanding invariant varieties for these polynomial dynamical systems, uh, you don't have to work nearly as hard as we did. Okay, so there are dynamical ways that you can get at it, which I think are I actually like better than, than, than what we did. But okay, that, that can be done. But the more general situation where the equations might be defined over, over non-constant parameters, you really do have to take into account the skew invariance. And it doesn't seem to be some dynamical way of getting at it. You really have to take into account all, uh, all possibilities. But in any case, we break into these two cases where either the equations were defined over the constants or they're not. And if I define over the constants, then you're looking at invariant curves. And these have been classified. And they basically just come down to looking at certain polynomial uh, equations. Okay, so I was saying that, oh, well, we only know that we have this order one equation in tau between you know, uh, involving f. But once you know that this, this order, order one equation is, real, is, is connected, to that sigma equation, you know, so that it basically comes from, uh, has to come from an invariant curve for the p comma p, well then, really you have a polynomial equation. Maybe with t to the one over k instead of t to the k. Right? So the only invariant curves that you have are, okay, so there's certain, some horizontal invariant curves and there's some diagonal, and there's some vertical invariant curves. But if they're not horizontal or vertical, then they are just the graphs of polynomials. And not just any old polynomials, but basically polynomials which commute with, uh, with, with P. And these, one understands okay, what, what these guys can look like. So the second equation that we have say, is going to be something like this. It's going to be that you have this polynomial in F is equal to F tau. Right? And that polynomial, as I said, is a special, is a special, special shape. And it follows from this, like, you just start iterating things that tau and sigma would satisfy an interesting relation when evaluated on F. But tau and sigma weren't supposed to satisfy any interesting relations. And so it's, it's not quite that sigma and tau are equal, you know, sigma of F equals, uh, equals tau of F, but maybe after iterating a few times, you're going to get, you're going to get equality, which you're not supposed to have. You're not supposed to have. Okay, so our hypothesis was that sigma and tau are independent. Well, they'll be dependent. Okay, so... Uh, so this can't happen. Yeah, that's what I was saying. The only role that G plays is to get this relation 
you get a second equation, uh, get a second equation for f. And, uh, and you've, I guess all you need to assume to get that argument going is that the equation that G satisfies is order one. It doesn't even have to be a polynomial, a polynomial relation. Okay, okay so when, uh, when something's happening, when these functions are different, then, well, then you have to work harder, okay? So it's, uh, you know, it's more complicated. Right? So even though it's more complicated, well, it's more complicated, I'll, I'll tell you what the complications are and then tell you how to undo the complications. Okay, so that's, that's somehow the, the main point. So you want to know what are the invariant or really the skew invariant curves for these uh, dynamical systems given by x, y goes to a polynomial in x comma a polynomial in y. What do they look like? And what we show is that these can be explicitly built up by step-by-step by step looking at some very explicit forms of possible invariant curves. And, the, and I, I see here that actually I left, did I leave out the, I left out the one, <laughs> okay, I left out one step, but, but you'll yell at me when I look at that step. Okay, so uh, you could take, so there are, there should be one more step that I didn't write down, but you can have an isomorphism between these two dynamical systems, and then of course the graph of that isomorphism is going to be invariant, okay? That's one possibility. Okay, you could compose that to something we call a skewed twist. So if you think about it a bit, if there's a, if there's a possible way to express your function as a, as a composite of two other functions, and express the other guy as composite with the same functions, but where you've reversed the order and you put a sigma, and I think you put it in the right place, then the graph of one of these pieces is going to be invariant with respect to this, with respect to this curve. And so I think I've written this down correctly, but you can just, did I reverse it? No, I think that's correct. You think it's, okay, maybe I reversed it. I think you want R1 to be R2 composed of, you want R to be R2 composed on R1. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, composition goes from the... Goes from, we're doing algebraic composition instead of the... <laughs> 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 and S, okay. Functions act on the right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a, another kind of weird situation, which I'll call a writ move. Uh, and the move is just to pretend like the parenthesis isn't there which of course you know, does something. Um, these are different functions, but the graph of the power function will be invariant with respect to this pair, this pair of functions. Again, if I do it in the right order, and I hope I've done it in the right order, but I might have reversed it again. Okay, um, okay so Chebyshev functions commute with each other, and so you can get, so if it turns out that one of your guys happens to be a Chebyshev function, then minus a Chebyshev function, then you can get an interesting invariant curve by looking at graphs of Chebyshev. This actually follows from other cases, and power functions commute with each other, and so graphs of comparing two different power functions are invariant under under power maps. Okay, so uh, and then the other case that I didn't say, which I should have said, I think, is that uh, you can look at the. You know, I, I, I didn't actually talk about the uh, the function itself commutes with itself. I mean, so. If you, yeah, is that included? Special case of the skewed twist. Oh, good. All right, good. I was afraid that I, that I hadn't actually included. That's the special case of the skewed twist. Yes. Okay. So you can get curves by just composing these and then taking components sometimes of these kinds of compositions. Okay. So we, so most of this, most of this, I, I would say, is already in Ritz papers. That's you can get all of the that you can get all of your invariant curves this way. Well, I didn't quite say it this way, and this isn't quite the way that, that he described it. Most of this information is there. The work that we did was to reduce, you know, to say exactly what's, how many steps you need, what's the shape of the, what are the shape of the compositions, and all of that. And the key point is that for the kinds of rational functions that are, if polynomials we're interested in, uh, most of those interesting steps don't occur. 
So you don't have to worry about the power functions. You don't have to worry about the writ moves. The, all, that you, the, all that you're going to see are the uh, skew twists and some linear and, and some linear things built into it. Okay? And you can even and restrict exactly how many. Okay? So that's say the you specialize we specialize our classification to the case where the second polynomial is can be obtained from the first one just by applying an automorphism to the coefficients. And really, it's not so much the, the point that there's an automorphism, but that they have some of the same shape. So when you look at the, you try to decompose the polynomial into, in, in, into pieces, it has the same degrees and the, and the, and the same basic, basic shapes for each of the, each of the pieces in the, in the decomposition. The only way that you can get an invariant curve, a skew invariant curve for the pair of them is by looking at skew twists and linears. Now you have to do some work. And you know, we did this work. And it follows from this that's maybe not with the function we started with. But after applying the sigma enough times and replacing f with some, with some image under, under powers of the automorphism, you can reduce the case that the equations that are satisfied are sigma of f equals a polynomial in f, although it's not f anymore, it's like f to some power, f to sigma to some power, and the polynomial is something you get by composing many things. And that when you apply tau, and again, it might not actually be tau, it might be tau composed with something, to, uh, to f, it satisfies a linear equation relative to f. Okay. So from the general form, you reduce to these very special polynomial equations where actually the, the second polynomial equation can, can be taken to be linear. And now one has to push, and I would say this is mostly Quas doing this last part, that this pushing actually works. Okay. Um, you, you can argue that actually you can't have equa solutions to equations like this. Right? And it's not, I say, you know, look at coefficients and so on, it's more complicated than one would like. Okay, but it's but it it does work. Okay. All right. So okay. So that's yeah. That's basically it for the uh, for the actual actual theorem. But the it's it fits I think into the same patterns of ones we've we've seen before. That's you start with a general form of these two different kinds of Mahler Mahler equations. You go from the fact you have a pair of them in an algebraic dependence to getting just equations involving one of the automorphisms. On, on the on the one uh, on the one side, and then by using classification theorems. So in the linear case, it's a lot of differential or difference Galois theory. In the um, nonlinear case, this classification of invariant curves. Uh, you push it down to where the equations you have are so simple that they can't possibly have can't possibly have solutions. Okay, so let me end with five questions just to say what's left open. So first thing, which is I mean, not exactly left open, it's still kind of a loose end, is what exactly the situation is when these are both special functions. And as I said, I, I think the answer is in the Mahler case that we still get the result that, you, that you'd expect. In the general case, there are, there are examples where you have algebraic dependence, but there'll be other cases where you shouldn't have algebraic dependence. Now we described have something to do with what kind of functions you need to get the conjugation from your special function to the very special ones, new power function and Chebyshev. Chev. So that's I think maybe not a not a big issue. I think a more interesting problem would be say what would happen if you're dealing with several uh, Mahler equations. So instead of just two, you'd have twenty okay, with respect to commuting automorphism, which again are independent independent enough. And we assume that these are all, say, polynomial uh, Mahler equations. Uh, the corresponding theorem should be true here. You know that's, that you can't have algebraic uh, can't have algebraic dependencies. And uh, the basic outlines of our proof, I think, actually still more or less apply. But you know, one has to one has to actually do that. <laughs> one has to actually think through that. Now, the third one I would say is the, I mean the, the first uh, serious open question uh, on this list, and that is to extend the uh, the classification to rational type Mahler functions. 
So assuming now that we have two Mahler functions, or in the, maybe in the generalized, generalized sense, functions, you know, elements of some big algebraic closed fields, where they satisfy an equation sigma of f equals p of f and uh, tau of g equals um, q of g, where the p and q are rational functions. Can you have algebraic dependence in that case? And the counterexample they mentioned, the j function, you know, for the order one equations, uh, doesn't fit here because this, it's not a rational dependence. Not a rational dependence. <laughs> now, for the kinds of the kind of proof that we gave uh, using the classification of screen invariant curves, that classification uses in a very strong way that we're dealing with polynomials. It uses uh, Ritz theory of polynomial decompositions in basically every step of the, of the arguments. And Ritz theorem for rational functions is, well, we don't know <laughs> whether, I mean, first of all, it's false in the direct translation, uh, but even with the, with, a, with a substitute ought to be, we don't really know. That said, we don't really need to know the full Ritz theorem or the full classification. So we're only interested in skew invariant curves for rational functions, or pairs of rational functions of the form p comma p sigma, or p tau. Okay? And there it doesn't seem totally hopeless to, that one might be able to classify what the invariant curves look like. And if you could, then you, would, uh, then you could carry out the same arguments to, uh, to conclude that there can't be an algebraic dependence. Okay? And... Uh, so just a similar question here is we've, we've shown is you can't have sigma of f equals p of f and an order one equation in town. But could you have an order two equation, order three, order nine uh, equation? That seems unlikely, and I think that we might actually know how to do that. Yeah, you think it, it follows from the? Okay, it may, it may it may it may already follow. In which case, it's good. The answer is yes. Um, and the last, I'd say, very hard question on this list is: uh, one should really deal with the case of order one equations in in general, and explain why it is that the J function appears. Okay? So, one would expect. That the only way that you could that you could have a function which satisfies K-Mahler equations with respect to infinitely many uh, algebraic or multiplicatively independent Ks would be that it's it comes from something like the J function. It has to there has to be some action of some algebraic group somewhere which explains where this uh, where these where these equations are coming from. But I don't know a way to make that a precise uh, a precise statement. So part of this problem is to come up with a precise way of stating that only those kinds of functions which, which come from these kinds of covering maps might give you many uh, in, independent solutions. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. So these are theorems and characteristics of zero. Yes. Know what's going on at these conceptual cases in characteristic P? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the in, in characteristic P, uh, no, we don't. Again, so this writ theorem is false in characteristic P, even for, even for polynomials. And I don't really know a good substitute for it in, in characteristic P. Okay. Only seem to appear at the end in order to study the shape of the sigma skew or yeah, the curves, right? Yeah. If you had a different operator, which also happens to commute with sigma, like for example a differential operator, could you imagine that you could do part of the attendance uh, or under some suitable hypothesis? I mean, that they only commute on C. Uh, no. you could imagine that something. Yeah, I mean it's I mean the yeah, the, the actual steps of the arguments, no, but um, but yeah, yeah, but, but you could but you could imagine that 
It probably, there probably should be a similar kind of statement, which is true when the second one is a differential operator, which computes 